part of uh, our 90th birthday celebrations. Uh, CPRE was founded in March 1931 by, and the first chairman was the author and MP, John Buchan, uh, who lived locally. Then as now, there was a great need to preserve, both preserve the countryside and ensure that it was probably planned, properly planned for the future. And CPRE was heavily involved in s helping set up the planning system that we now have. For all its faults, it has protected us from some of the uh, worst uh, deprecations of, of, of ribbon development and inappropriate development. Uh, I should just say that we're not charging for this, uh, this, this, these lectures. But if you did want to make a contribution to CPRE, uh, we do have a 90th birthday appeal, which you can find on our website and a just giving page there. So uh, do do have a look at that. So just to uh, get to the main part of this evening. Uh, the, uh, as many of you will be aware, the countryside will change and it's what CPRE are interested in is to ensure that it changes for the better. And we have to make, but there's a lot of pressures on, on the countryside from climate change, from increasing population, increasing development. Uh, and, and of course, the changes that came with us leaving Europe and the environment bill that is just working its way rather slowly through Parliament. And uh, what we want to see, and I'm, is a countryside and a rural economies that prosper and are resilient to the many pressures that we're going to see in the future. So I'm very pleased to welcome Ian Wil Wilkinson, who's a farmer in North Oxfordshire and uh, has been looking at new and traditional ways of sustainable farming. And so I think I'll just stop there and hand you over to, uh, to, to Ian. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you this evening. Um, I just have a thumbs up, make sure you can hear me. I'm sure you can. Could you somebody? Thank you, Helen. Thank you, Richard. Um, very good evening from uh, Oxfordshire. I, I guess some of you will also be from the county. Um, I'm near uh, between actually Burford and Chipping Norton, uh, just outside of Shipton under Witchwood. Uh, I'm on the farm tonight and I've been helped to get online by Chris, who's just leaving. I think he's quite happy now. Um, but we had a <clears throat> we do have a very good rural broadband, <laughs> thank goodness. And also um, PhD Chris behind me who has come to my rescue this evening. So um, it's uh, a pleasure to be with you. Um, this subject is really dear to my heart. I probably ought to just tell you a little bit about me just to set the context before we move on. And I would like to say, you know, I'd really like to get to questions and answers reasonably promptly because I think it makes for a more interesting conversation. Um, but I would just like to set the scene by first of all telling you that I am um, I've been in here in this district for in the Evenlode Valley for uh, 35 years and I went to agricultural college. I wanted to be a farmer, had no land land and I perhaps naively went along with some friends of mine from over many years now but farmers who did have land and I found it interesting at the beginning to um to to study agriculture but not to be able to farm it so um so that sort of run through me really as we've gone on through the years <clears throat> but I was um <clears throat> I was lucky having gone to Berkshire College of Agriculture I lived just outside of Reading and I was brought up uh, in a village um on the outskirts and I remember the days very clearly when I used to work on local farms mixed farms diverse farms there was uh, every corner you went around, there was something really interesting. So different crops, different animals, different businesses. There was local food going into Reading at the time, and it was very vibrant. It seemed like, um, you know, we were industrializing, we were specializing, but that was the era that I was brought up in 35 years ago. And so when I went to agricultural college, um, a number of things happened. Firstly, I met my lovely wife, who 
I, you know, have uh, uh, we've had four lovely children in this area, and you know, been, been extremely happy. So that was the most important thing in my life. Secondly, I I, I found a career in agriculture, which um, has been really quite diverse, and I've thoroughly enjoyed and, and relish the challenge ahead of us now to farm in the 21st century. So when I was training uh, back in the day. Uh, it was all about yield. Everything was about productivity. And so the, not unsurprisingly, everything got bigger, more industrialized, more factory orientated. So very quickly in the late 1970s and early 80s, um, these are the days, remember, those of us that were around when Sainsbury's came to town, when McDonald's arrived on the high street. And prior to that, it was actually really very different, very different in the sense that people were actually in this country still remembering uh, hung hungry times after the Second War. And food production was all important. It was, it was really important to be affordable and lots of it. And that was the sort of mantra that we were trained in. So we didn't, I wasn't trained in thinking about um, carbon. I wasn't trained to think too much about wildlife um, or food quality. It was all about the quantity. And that's how I started. Now, just contrast that with what, where we are now. I spent most of my time before, and I'll talk about Farm Ed briefly, but before I started at, here at Farm Ed, um, I spent most of my years at Cotswold Seeds. And uh, that's a seed business that supplies 15,000 farmers. And I've been very lucky and fortunate to have been, well, to work there and also to own the business um, through good fortune. So about 10 years ago, um, my wife, Celine and I decided that we could do something that would be in addition to that, which would be very much um, for uh, putting something back in, if you like, but really reflecting the good things that we had seen across the countryside, having spoken to so many great farmers, we wanted to really highlight that. And that's why we started Farm Ed. And I'll come to that in a second. So we, um, let's see if I can move my screen. Just bear with me one second. Huh. Oh, there we go. So we were challenged, first of all, with providing healthy food for people. And that was the biggest single challenge that we faced. But of course, the change in the climate has really determined um, massive change in the countryside. I mean, none of us can ignore what's happening now. You know, if you if you are at all attached to any civilization, you realize that the climate is, is one of our biggest issues of our time. And of course, agriculture not only uh, affects that, but also can be part of the solution. We also uh, work particularly or are working along with, well, alongside wildlife where we can, and that has come to the fore, particularly with biodiversity loss. So these three things now run in alongside each other uh, and are all, in my opinion, equally important. But there's a lot more, a lot more than there was to consider. We've got a really competitive world. You know, we're competing on the world stage. I think, Richard, you mentioned um, Europe, but, you know, looking worldwide, you know, there is huge change going on around the world. This is a, an image um, that shows a, a pig factory in uh, China. I believe there's something like 8,000 sounds in there now. And I'm not sure, you know, what others think, but I think, you know, this, this feels so removed from where I was trained, where most farmers ha have been. Uh, and, and it is a brave new world, perhaps, but um, I'm sort of horrified by this stuff, um, but I just wanted to mention it. But I also think there's hope. I mean, farmers are being you know, uh, attracted to financial rewards. Uh, they're given incentives to do different things. I mean, here, for example, this is a Rodale advert on the top left, which is an advert for um, uh, regenerative uh, organic farming in America. Um, uh, on the bottom right, this is um, a regenerative agriculture food production initiative sponsored by McCain's, uh, which is a large, very large food organization, which from a protein point of view has probably been quite involved with a lot of protein production around the world and is now looking to use plants instead of uh, animals. So some really big changes and perhaps opportunities for farmers, which will be funded, I am sure. But we're still surrounded by these really real extremes. You know, so many people in the world go to bed hungry. And yet we are told and we know we waste so much food. You know, if you follow the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, for example, you'll know that so much food is wasted and that actually there is more than enough food to feed people throughout the world. If only it was used more effectively. We know in the Western world that people are subject to bad diets. You know, uh, obesity and diabetes are two massive killers in the Western world. 
and you know there's this real dichotomy between uh, people in different different parts of the world depending on how, how they sit as to how they how they might see their food we're surrounded also by changes in terms of how people uh, see things uh, this image is very divisive um, but if you're a farmer producing livestock uh, you're probably wondering what on earth is going on out there uh, given you know having decades of production of food without necessarily being challenged in the way that it's been produced there are radical solutions out there things like um, the beyond burger meat uh, which is obviously not meat um, these these types of products are, are gaining inroads and if you want to be really radical then think about cell based uh, cell, cell grown meat as an example. These things are having huge amounts of money put into them, particularly plant proteins. And although cell based meat at the moment seems far fetched, it is being produced and it could be part of the future. None of us, of course, at this stage know. And it is really easy. And I feel at times really overwhelmed. And Celine and I, you know, we, we're so mindful of what other people are feeling, particularly around agriculture that we feel quite grounded when we're back in Oxfordshire. And we feel that sometimes there is so much going on in the world that we have absolutely no control over whatsoever, that it's really, really important to get back to the soil, to get back to your own land, what you, in other words, the things that you can control. So I want to start our story really by talking about Oxfordshire. I want to talk to you about this particular piece of Oxfordshire. If you look across the hill, this was um, this is where I am right now. Um, I'm just above the E in the get. <laughs> um, and um, this landscape is typical, a lot of arable fields. Uh, when this photograph was taken, you can see some old seed rape. So it tells you it was early May, roughly, lots of winter wheat, lots of bare fields to be planted with spring corn, no doubt. Um, and not very much grassland, although there's a bit under the Oxford Shire, as you can see. So eight years ago, this farm came on the market and we were fortunate in that the seed business had been running for four decades. And although not profitable for the first two or three, uh, I can tell you through first hand experience, it did start to make a little bit of money about 15 years ago which built up in our bank account. And we live all, we already live here in this valley and we just felt that buying some land or investing in some land would be the right thing for the business to do, particularly farmland. So this farm came on the open market, it went to auction and we were fortunate enough to be able to buy it. it a, if anyone's ever bought anything at auction, you'll know what sort of feeling that is. Uh, it's a horrible sinking feeling when that hammer goes down, especially if you've got a big mortgage as I have now uh, to go with it. So, um, but I got over the shock of that after four or five years. And um, here we are now on this farm. So when we started, most of the farm was uh, arable and uh, typical oolitic limestone, Cotswold Brash, beautiful crop here of uh, ripening spring barley. That was the, some of the bare fields that were sown. And for the first year, we did nothing other than what the previous farmers had done. And the crop um, was quite interesting. It grew perfectly well for a spring barley crop on thin soil. It uh, had its fertilizers, we spent money on it, but here's the numbers. So we had 60 acres of malting barley uh, eight years ago. It cost us about 11,000 pounds to grow it and we sold it for beer for about 11,000 pounds as well. We actually didn't make any money on that crop at all across over half of the farm, it's a small farm. And this is typical of what can happen in on poor, relatively poor quality soil from an economic perspective. And you cannot get away from the fact that the farming of these commodity crops is not profitable for farmers. So no wonder farmers are belly aching about this right now because of the fact that also the money will be going from uh, the, the single farm payment. So all of us that would receive money like this are going to see a big decrease very rapidly over the next few years. And farmers are now thinking about changes. A lot of farmers are thinking about changes. Uh, they, a lot of farmers want to change from, uh, from systems like this to something that's perhaps more uh, diverse and don't underestimate the importance of the economic in, in this in these decisions that will, will, will be made. When we came to the farm, because there was we had had 30 years or so of um, continuous cereals on this farm, we decided that we would keep some of the ground, only a hectare, under the same management regime just to reflect and really to capture what was going on. Because otherwise, if we made changes to the farm, we wouldn't really know what they uh, what, what to compare them to. 
So just last week, uh, this, this this piece of ground that we, uh, we're sowing now with winter wheat, in fact, we've just sown it two days ago, was sprayed with glyphosate and it will receive um, uh, broadleaf and, and grass graminicides to keep the land clear of weeds. It'll receive fertilizers and probably have seven or eight passes with the tractor in order to grow the crop. And the crop will grow perfectly well and we, will give us the thing I was trained to do, which is yield. And we'll probably have eight or nine tonne a hectare, which is equivalent to roughly three loaves of bread per square metre. It's astonishingly productive. And if you want yield, that's the system that, that currently gives it to us. But I'm more interested in the soil. I'm particularly concerned that on these thin soils, we have very little organic matter. And when you look at the top soil that's on this farm, you know, it's difficult to get a spade into it, frankly. I've been out showing people around today. I do every day. And it's really, really difficult to get a spade in because it's, it's just full of stone. And the deeper you go, the bigger the stones get. But it is possible to lock carbon into the soil. And going back to the climate, can we cool the planet? Can, we, can agriculture cool the planet? Well, the answer is yes, because we can sequester carbon in our own peculiar agricultural way. So this isn't going to lock it up underground, deep underground, but this is going to grow it in the soil. Um, and I believe that growing carbon in the top soil is probably going to be quicker than trees. And I know at COP26, people are going to be talking about um, coal, cars, cash, and I'm sure Boris Johnson will talk about trees. And that's fine. We should all be planting trees. We planted 12,000 trees here already on this little farm. We've got agroforestry seeds going in. It's really important, but I don't believe it's quick enough. And I think the agricultural system of mixed farming can be significantly quicker. Uh, and I'll, I'll explain why. We have the perfect climate for growing forage crops. We have rain, we ha okay, with, with, with big long periods between. You know, you, the extremes of weather that we currently have, going back to Richard's comment on resilience, the extremes of weather we currently have are going to make our annual cropping really risky. It's already risky. We, always, we already have one out of every four or maybe five years as an extreme drought year. We already have extremely wet winters. You know, th these conditions are very challenging for farmers because it's very difficult to grow short term crops in them. What would help that, I believe, is to have uh, pastures in rotation on this farm. Every, far every context is different. But on this farm where we have poor quality light land, we desperately need to get organic matter in because if we can get organic matter into the soil. That's the roots of the plants you're looking at. It's the debris. It's the animal manure. All those things going back into the soil will act as a sponge, which will hold moisture in the soil. Then when we plough those up or destroy them and grow our annual crops, our annual crops of wheat, barley, oats, or whatever they might be, will be much more reliable. Also, there's a huge benefit from having deep roots in the soil because those roots will access minerals that the shallow rooted wheats and grasses don't. So deep rooting plants such as chicory or sandfoin, lucerne, you know, ribgrass, whatever it might be, will make our food more nourishing. So for me, mixed farming, which is what this leads to, will provide us with healthy soil and ultimately that provides us with healthy food and that would go some way towards relieving some of the pressure that the uh, health services will be under as we go on with a very poor quality diet you know the population in my lifetime has doubled on the strength probably of four crops wheat uh, rape uh, sorry wheat uh, rice um, soy and uh, corn or maize as we might know it here i mean those are the four crops look around they're, they're all the ones that have gone up the hundreds of other crops that we could grow have not increased in acreage. So no wonder we have poor diets. It does, of course, mean that if we have pastures or fertility building crops, as I've known them, that's what I call them, it's what I've done for most of my uh, time in the seed trade, we need something that can utilize those plants. Obviously, wildlife can, but there aren't very many animals that can consume this, uh, consume this type of um, produce. We can't, but ruminants can. And so from a herbivore's perspective, they do bring something to the table. And I think that's quite important, particularly in a farming system that is now devoid here of livestock. So we have, as you know, had the livestock that were mixed into our farming systems as I was brought up with. Now they've been moved to the west of the country where it's not really suitable for growing arable crops. So there's been polarization between the livestock in the west and the arable in the east. That I think is a mistake. And I'd love to see the reintegration of animals, but not to the extent where they overrun the place, that certainly wouldn't be my point. My point would be they'll bring the fertility in reasonable numbers and quite quickly, and that would enable us to lock up carbon, which the annual crops won't do. This is what it looks like on our farm. So this was the first year that we put herbal lays in. These are deep rooting multi-species swords. I won't bore you with the details, but there's about 17 different plants. What you're looking at is 
ewes and lambs grazing in a very tightly controlled way. This is mob grazing. So these animals are moving across in a mob every 24 hours onto a different patch. There's about 100 animals here and they have about an eighth of an acre. It's all sorts of questions around. I mean, they're, they're really super healthy. There's lots of anthelmintic plants. That means they don't get worms. There's lots of protein in these plants. That means we don't have to buy soy. They stay out all year round. But where are the hedges? Where's the shelter? Where's the browse? These are things that we need to address going forwards, but we're starting. Technology has changed. We have electric fences, mobile water. Celine and I move these animals every day. We love it. And, you know, for us, it's, it's a joy to do. So I think, you know, going forwards, this sort of system is quite interesting. This is what it looks like if you're a bird. So these are, these are sheep mob grazing in, uh, on the farm here. And there's a group also of mob grazing farmers, or I'm not sure who that group is, but our farm is becoming a living textbook of some of the things that you could do. And we're certain, I'm certainly not advocating that everyone goes and does this. What I'm saying is the principles of it, the mixtures, the diversity, the different things all collectively together will make a farm ecosystem. So we're trying, we're, we're trying to make a demonstration model. Demonstration farms don't exist these days otherwise. This was our plan, and we've pretty much stuck to it, actually. Um, this was our plan of some of the things that you could do. And I'm not going to bore you with the details, but we have got all sorts of livestock integration. We've got all sorts of crops. We have our control plot. We have uh, ex scientific experimentation, vegetable production, fruit production, natural flood management, loads of trees planted, hedgerows gone in. You know, you name it, it's all going on here. And people love coming to see it. And we've done it deliberately. It's not, we're not trying to show how a small farm can be profitable per se. We're trying to demonstrate the good things that it can bring. The profitability will follow uh, uh, almost certainly. But these, these are the, some of the things that we've done. This is Celine. Um, we, this was a small area of wheat that we were growing in the middle of a crop of rye. This was a multiplication about five years ago of a, a small parcel of seed that my good friend Rupert Dunn, who's a farmer in Wales, he's a baker as well, he had been growing it and he gave me a little bag of seed, which we grew on. And after a very short period of time, we've multiplied, well, six years, we've multiplied this up to, uh, to a, a, a field scale. We've had to use little combines because um, that's what you do when you're on small scales. We don't, we do have a combine, we use it quite small, um, but we don't have, um, we can't afford, you know, massive combines, nor do we have the big fields for them, nor do we want them because we have lots of diversity. And that's a real issue. If you have diversity, inevitably you get um, small quantities. One big 60 acre block of barley gives you Guess what? Just barley. What we've, what we've done is we've diversified it all up. And that raises questions around the supply chain. How do supply chains, how do supermarkets and their suppliers engage with farmers with diversity? And I'll show you why I think the diversity is important, because it does deliver us so many things. But we have small quantities. This is the wheat. Isn't it amazing? I mean, genetically very diverse. We've been helped along with this wheat by not only Rupert Dunn, but by John Letts last year, gave us some grains and other people along the way too. It's a real team effort. But these grains, you know, you would have had here hundreds of years ago, probably. They would have been brought in by the Vikings or somebody would have moved them across the, across the seas. The fact is, these grains don't require any inputs at all. Compared to the crop where we run across six or seven times with uh, fertilizers and um, herbicides and fungicides, these receive no inputs. So they don't give us the yield. And you might say, well, how much less do you get? And does that mean we need twice as much land? The answer is we do get less, probably half, especially when we, when we have a transition from an intensive system to a non-intensive one, we're definitely going to lose yield. But the quality of the food, the mineral content of the food should be much higher. And where does this food go? You know, look at the stats and figure out where does this food go? Is it being fed to humans or is it going to be made in an inefficient, inefficient use by going through the animal supply chain? And I put it to you that in the UK, we could be producing a lot more animals on our pastures, building fertility and having a lot less animals in intensive systems like the Chinese system that I showed you at the beginning. Underneath our crops, this is a crop of oats, but it has, if you notice, the lovely green material below it is clover, which we've sown deliberately. We wanted to cover the soil, fixed nitrogen, of course, clover is a legume. So it's, um, you know, for thousands of years, we've known that clover improves soil fertility. The air is three quarters nitrogen. You can, you can transfer that into the soil with these marvelous uh, plants. And this doesn't cause a problem for the combine. 
and also gives the sheep something to graze. Our sheep right now are on the clover that's on this farm after harvest. Very beneficial, costs nothing, all sown on the same day. This is a cover crop. This is a crop in the summer, which was sown. And as you can see, lots of biomass, an annual crop. In the right conditions, this crop here on this farm grew really, really well. But it doesn't always get enough moisture. But this is an annual crop. And the difference between this and a pasture is this needs perfect conditions. Sown in May, warm soils, lots of rain, you get this. But if you had no rain, as we, as we didn't this year, you would have half this crop. And suddenly the cover crops that look really exciting in the no-till arable systems can be quite poor on this ground. We need to get the fertility in first before we can start to rely on these sorts of cover crops. I'm not saying they're bad, just saying they're not quite as good as perhaps we might like. The windows are really narrow and the risks are actually quite high. We've made lots of mistakes here. This is me and Sam. Uh, Sam is a great friend of mine and um, been involved with agriculture in this area for a long time. Uh, we're roll crimp rolling here. We've made a crimper roller to put on the front of the tractor. So rather than using herbicide to kill the cover crop, we're actually crushing it with a roller. And you might wonder why we're doing that. Well, simply because the amount of glyphosate that's being used is uh, it's prophylactically used and we're all concerned that it will be withdrawn. I'm very much part of industrial agriculture. You must realize that already. But, you know, we are looking for new techniques. We're looking for ideas that could be sustainable, truly sustainable, rather than things that may well uh, be withdrawn from the market, just as neonicotinoids have been withdrawn from growing all seed rape, and hence the uh, problems that, that farmers have had. Uh, they're now unable to grow that crop. We have lots of science and, and uh, going on on the farm. This is uh, Reading University monitoring the amount of growth we're getting on these complex lays. Um, it won't surprise you to know, and if you follow Darwin, you'll know that you get an overyielding effect when you grow different plants together. In this case, there's, this is a young lay with about 20 different species growing, and we got uh, an overyielding effect to the point where these crops were growing more than the fertilized ryegrass was. And that's quite astonishing when you think about it because people of my era have didn't think that was possible, but it is simply by mixing species together. Farmers have been telling me this for years and I perhaps, you know, when I started, when I left college, I, I didn't really listen, but it's, it's notable that um, this, these, this happens and it's great to see the research backing this up. Really well-funded research, well-documented. Agritech, uh, Chris was in the room earlier on, as you know, I was struggling a little bit, some of you will know. Um, and this is um, Chris with a drone, but you know, the, the use of, um, uh, not only the technology, but and also data. There's questions around who owns the data, of course, but, uh, and, and also the technology. But, you know, there are lots of robotics. There's lots of work being done in this field. I suspect that if you ask uh, our colleagues on the farm here, there's quite a, there's 15 people employed now here uh, on this farm. Uh, if you ask them whether some agritech would be useful for, you know, uh, weeding, interrow weeding on vegetable production, for example, I think the answer would be yes. You know, people don't want to do that sort of work. The technology is there to assist us, but we don't have to totally rely on it, but it does need to be affordable. And at the moment, a lot of this technology is aimed at big scale. And we do need to talk about scale. Uh, small is beautiful as well as big. So I think it's important we recognize that. And this stuff needs to be available to people uh, to make their lives easier. I am a great believer in photosynthesis. This was an amazing crop of rye without any inputs whatsoever on this farm, on this soil that I've shown you. There's no depth of soil. And this was on right on the top of the hill. And yet we still managed to grow rye. Isn't that astonishing? I mean, you know, I mean, that this is a good year. This is a good wet year for growing. But photosynthesis is a pretty remarkable thing. Also, of course, during the photosynthetic process, we're able to lock up carbon into the soil. Isn't that amazing? That's what we should be doing. And I mentioned at the beginning, we work along wild, uh, alongside wildlife. And, you know, this hair is sort of typical of what goes on in this farm. We have some mammals that we actually don't want on the farm, or at least if they are here, we don't want them eating our trees. Um, deer, squirrels, as nice as they are to see, they are potentially disruptive. Um, plenty of other animals come here. Hares is an example. We have, I don't know how many hares exactly are here, but there's lots. Um, they're not an economic problem to us. And everyone that comes to the farm loves to see the wildlife. And that is a, a natural um, capital for us uh, as farmers. It's really important. And if we're going into a brave new world of not just growing food, but also sequestering carbon and working alongside wildlife, guess what? People will want to see the wildlife. And um, these are important. Pollinators also equally important. This is a sandfoin, beautiful, the most beautiful. This is the queen of forages. And um, sandfoin was on one in seven fields here in the Cotswolds. 
uh, until uh, the agricultural revolution. The reason the sound form was used, it was the horsepower. The horses were fed the high protein, wonderful forage, it's astonishing stuff. Um, but if you're a bee, pollen and nectar source is amazing. We have honey here on the farm, it's an apiary, and the honeybees uh, are, you know, it, 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 is, it is the queen of honey as well. It's drought resistant, the crop we have here is on 10 acres, and we sowed it in 2016, which by my reckoning is, um, what's that, six years on? roughly. And uh, we, apart from sowing the seed, we've not put a single drop of fertilizer on it. We've not used a single herbicide. We take two cuts a year, hay and silage, and the sheep will graze it very shortly. So this is an amazing crop, but you'll notice this is surrounded by other species. Chicory, I can see flowering there, sweet clover, I can see birds for truffle. Pollinators love this. If you haven't got pollinators, you know, we're in trouble. You know the stats, uh, but you know, I'm not gonna remind you. But if you go to Asia, this is what parts of Asia look like. I couldn't believe this. And a good friend of mine, Dave Goulson, who I spoke to years and years ago about this, he showed a similar slide in a talk in Chipping Norton Town Hall one day when, when there was a literary festival on there. And I thought, oh, I'm not going completely barking because he's also found the same thing. And we looked into it and there's busloads of people being shipped out of cities to the rural districts to pollinate fruit crops. Can you believe that? I mean, I, I know why people do, you know, I can understand people, you know, breeders pollinating by hand, but Really? You know, and drones. Some scientists have been working, developing drones to go and pollinate plants. What's wrong with bees? <laughs> let's, let's support our bees. All they need is habitat and they'll come back in numbers and we can do that on farms. Let's be more positive. Birds, we have lots of uh, birds here on the farm. When we came here in 2013, we started surveying every month. Richard Broughton from CEH kindly obliged and came and recorded everything. He, he mapped it all on GIS. We could see where the birds were nesting. We started with 44 species. Very quickly, the numbers increased with the diversity that we started to introduce on the fields. Uh, we didn't put up bird boxes and think we have loads on the buildings here, but we, these are new buildings. But when we started, it was habitat. So we created margins, of course. We had, uh, we left hedges to grow. So in other words, we were, we were creating uh, areas where there were seed crops, where there were insect bearing uh, 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 fruit crops, uh, hedges that weren't cut to within an inch of their lives. And all of a sudden the bird numbers went through the roof. We created some water, which I'll show you next, but that, that also brought in species that we weren't otherwise seeing. So 44 to 85 species and still rising, I guess we will see more, although the, the numbers will slow down. But if you're a bird looking down from above, you definitely need somewhere to mate, you, need, you know, to nest, and somewhere to, um, to, to get your food from. I think it's quite simple. And, you know, we can do that within, within agriculture. Many farmers are, you know, already doing this. And my guess is that the more that do it, the, the, the quicker the numbers will recover. This is what the bottom half of the farm looks like from the air. And I wanted to show you this because this is um, six years ago, but it shows you uh, how we've captured the water from the spring line, which is where the old buildings were. And a friend of ours locally said, you know, this would be a really easy project to uh, to create. And if you look at the little little um, uh, connections uh, between the water, we they weren't there originally. And we just literally dug three or four ponds and they got bigger as they went down. They're not very deep. They're just scrapes, really. And then we connected them up with little channels. And those little lines you can see are stone dams. And the big ponds have bigger stone dams, stone that we took off the top of uh, stone walls that have been that have been fallen down. We, re and we built the dams and the water now comes, it rises and trickles through the dams and, sl and slows down. And it, in isolation, of course, this won't stop flooding further downstream. There's, of course, Oxford, uh, down into London, there's 15 million people down there who will be flooded perhaps at some point, not helped by rain running straight off the top of the farms. So we wanted to encourage the, you know, I've told you water is a limiting factor here. We want to keep the water on the farm. We want to keep it where it falls. We planted lots of trees at the bottom now around the big uh, uh, pond at the bottom. 2,000 trees went in there. Again, more roots, more penetration, more water infiltration. Uh, great for habitats. Um, and it's been such a joy. I mean, loads of people have come to see it. This is what it looks like from the top. Again, this is a few years ago uh, now, before it's, uh, of course, a lot more reeds and rushes and things have come on it. Um, and we put a fence up to keep the animals off from a grazing point of view. But it's just great to see the water on the top. And the, um, the dog swims in it, which pleases us. But also, you know, the snipe come, the ducks come. You know, all the obvious things come along pretty quickly. 
We've had to scrape the top one out just once. Um, it filled up with silt. We got about 75% full and we emptied that last year. Apart from that, we haven't intervened. I'm sure we will have to occasionally just to keep it running, but it's been low cost. It costs 7,000 pounds. And um, I think it was a really good result. Public money for public good I raise here simply because Elms will probably encourage things like this going forwards, and that will be a lifeline for farmers. But remember with Elms, this means that farmers will I've told you that farmers are losing money on, on a basic farm payment and they will have the opportunity to recover some of that by, by delivering things they can't sell, uh, public good things, in this case, water or hedges or whatever, but they have to do something for it and there will be a cost to them. So they're gonna be in a bit of difficulty, I think, financially, especially with low food prices. Lots of people have come to see this water. Uh, this was a day we had um, a lot of people came, the Environment Agency, Rivers Trusts, farmers really interesting and, and and this is the sort of thing we do on the farm we want people to see this thing and and, and at the same time that we were doing this other people along the valley public hot dalesford um, bruin and other farmers have been doing similar things and if you look down from above now you'll see a bit of joined up thinking in the valley and that's probably the way for us to go as farmers clusters of farmers working together with knowledgeable people from outside of agriculture surely is going to create result great results that we, we will all benefit from Talking of doing things differently in the future, this is um, this is the kitchen garden people. Um, this is a micro business on the farm here. These guys have five acres now. They started with a small area. There's uh, Dan on the top left, uh, Matt bottom left, and Emma uh, talking to the group of uh, MSc students from Oxford. And they have five acres of vegetable production. It was really striking to Celine and I when we came here. There was no food on the farm. If you'd have come here in the pandemic and said, "What you know, what food can we have?" There wouldn't have been any. It was barley for malting beer and no livestock, nothing. So unless you could eat grass or you wanted to just eat barley then or drink beer, which is nice, but probably not to survive on, uh, that was your lot. Now, these people have come. This is their business. They run it as a, a for-profit business. And they started growing um, five years ago here on the farm and have increased the amount of produce they uh, produce every year. And now they produce a lot of food. They have a different business model. They have, um, it's called a CSA, a Community Supported Agricultural Scheme. They have people that pledge money to them every month. It costs 30 pounds. And they, they started when they came here with 25 families. They now have the equivalent of 180 families in terms of production, just off five acres. It's amazing. And guess what? They bring people to the farm. We have an educational center, which I'll tell you about in a second. So that gives us an income, which is not necessarily food related exactly, but it brings people down our drive. And that's very important for this farm to be viable because we're a small farm. So it's a different route to market. It's very popular. And these guys are great growers, communicators, and ambassadors for a different style of food production in the future. We import about 50% of our veg. I know there's a reason we do that, but we're not terribly secure if we're importing it across the water. We have other new entrants at the farm. These are cows, uh, as you recognize. Um, the cows came to the farm this year. These guys are mob grazing. This was the first day mob grazing. The cows have got calves in this shot, as you can see. They really didn't know what to do with it because they had come from a different system. But these are Swiss, Austrian cows. They're called Fleckvis, and it's a micro herd. This is Hallam on the left. Um, and Hallam is a young farmer, like I was with a, he's got a degree in agriculture from Harper Adams. Again, nowhere to farm. So he started his business here. Uh, it's a micro dairy, three cows and three calves. He's super proud of it. And he's such a good ambassador. Um, there's Georgia, his uh, partner. And um, together they milk the cows and move the cows. They milk the cows just once a day in the morning. And uh, the calves run with the cows at foot. It's a micro business. It gives him a small income. It's not a massive income, but it's a start. And I fully expect him to go on and run his own farm somewhere else very soon. And I hope that he leaves in his wake another bunch of young farmers just like him. And it's you know, really important for, I'm 58. I can't, I haven't got the life left in me to get up and milk cows at six in the morning and do all the other things that I do. Hallam has, and that's what makes this thing work. Here he is with the milk. Uh, he's got a little processing plant here. Um, he sells his milk for two pound a litre, sells it all. He, he just can't produce enough of it. Obviously, there's only 30 litres a day. He's proudly showing his own bottle, his own brand, his own business. Uh, we've provided him with a dairy room, which is a three a hygienic room, three, three rooms, 
he gets changed out of his milk and clothes. He pasteurizes his milk and then bottles it two liters. And there's your milk. And simple as that. There'll be no doubt ice cream and other things to follow. I just love the industrials, the industrious nature of this system. It's great. This is a, an orchard that we planted um, <clears throat> five years ago. 84% of our fruit uh, is imported, which is a huge quantity. Celine and I drive home, always drive home past the co-op in Milton under Witchwood. And we can get any fruit we like at any time of year. Avocados, blueberries, you name it. Look on the packets, you know what I'm going to say. Uh, South American, maybe uh, 8,000 miles away, plot it on a map. This is on our doorstep. And you will have unreliability. Of course you will, as with any fruit production. But, you know, I'm sure, and I'm, it's not just me, there will be plenty of others, not just the celebrities, but plenty of other people who wish to create these things. In fact, I know Prue Leaf has got her own orchard because I've seen it and I was really proud to show her ours. And I think there'll be loads more of these. There are more, there's more golf course covered in this country than there are orchards, just to put it into context. We have loads of people coming to the farm to see this sort of model, to see the sorts of things that could be done. These guys were visiting from Sri Lanka and India before the pandemic, um, and they were really inspirational people. They were attached to all sorts of very large corporations, but they were also, because of the region they'd come from, quite grounded in, ag in agroecology. They understood the social benefits of mixed farming and also including people on the land. And they were a really good reminder to me when they came around about how important it is to connect people to the farming and not just think about it from a from a business perspective. We have loads of people come here. This is inside the conference barn, which is right behind me now. I'm in this building. Uh, there's about 100 people here. This was a book a food writer's book launch. Um, and this is the sort of thing that we do at Farm Ed. Now, people are not coming here because it's a nice building. It is. But they're coming here because they want to know about carbon they want to know about wildlife they want to know about where their food comes from and this just typifies what's going on here right now and honestly 10 years ago when we started this project or eight years ago whenever it was we had absolutely no idea that people would come we, we couldn't understand perhaps why they'd come people were saying well you know you might be a bit crazy and quite understand the language you're using nor did we but now the world has changed really rapidly you know the earth shot prizes for example you know um greta all these people have made made big impacts and i think society is reflecting that and now is the time for change we have um these are students from the royal agricultural university i think winter's day cold farm these are the next generation these are the people that we need to connect with within agriculture and encourage them into farming they will make a difference i'm absolutely certain um and i'm encouraged when i meet people here every day i do this I, and i'm you know i'm there is no shortage of people who want to engage in this area believe you me this was the site. This was lunchtime today. Um, this is uh, 25 people on a three day course here. This is in our dining room uh, just across the way here in the courtyard. And um, these people are literally putting food into their mouths and changing the way farming is done. This is a market gardening course with farmers and small growers, 25 of them, three days. They're spending quite a lot of money to be here and uh, they're, they're determined to make a difference in the world. I think that's a vegetarian lunch, probably. That wasn't the point of the day, but they are literally making a difference with what they eat. But it's certainly from the farm, which is amazing. So for yourself, you're welcome to come and see us here at Farm Ed. Uh, this is a, a bird's eye view of where I'm sat now. Um, this was when the buildings were just finished about six months ago. And we are an educational centre. Our mission is to promote agroecology, and we make no apologies for that. We've moved beyond regenerative farming. I think regenerative farming is really interesting, and it's certainly a, everyone's on a different part of the journey in terms of restoring the land. But for us, it's about also a wider social impact that we would hope to have here. So um, I hope if you haven't been, uh, that, that you would one day come and please critique it because we're not the experts, it's you that are the experts. And by coming here, we can share that enthusiasm for change, which we all know is coming. It's just a matter of how it manifests itself. I probably ought to stop there um, because, well, I think time's gone on. So shall I mute and hand over to you, Helen, Richard?